Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan, and welcome back to our continuing coverage of the trial of at least the year. I always hesitate to say trial of the century because I just find that to be a little bit hyperbolic. Uh, but on your screen right now is perhaps a surprising image. It is the Itch.io announcement that they are going to be available in the Epic Game Store. Now, before anybody complains about my pronunciation of Itch.io, I want to refer back to a tweet from them that says that pronunciation is okay. We accept all pronunciation, so I'm going to stick with the way that I have always said it. But why is this image on our screen? Well, as it turned out, it became a relatively strong talking point between the two parties as part of yesterday's testimony. So we will, of course, be discussing that. If you don't know, we now have an almost 40 video playlist called an N antitrust epic that talks all about when this started, how it started, the mega drop, what Epic did, the complaints, the restraining orders, the injunctions, various people commenting on it, and of course, this past week, the litigation itself. So please do check that out uh, because we're not going to be able to cover everything that goes into the foundations of this discussion in just this video. Now, before we always talk about the day's testimony, we try to capture the things that have happened behind the scenes, the leaks, the documents. And one of the things that happened yesterday actually reflects back on the testimony given by Vice President Microsoft, Lori Wright. As Tom Warren from The Verge describes in this tweet, Apple isn't happy with Microsoft's Xbox executive testimony. Apple's lawyers want the judge to declare Microsoft's witnesses as not credible because of a lack of documents to back up claims about xCloud, Xbox hardware not being profitable, and more. And you go and you look at this particular motion, says, hey, we talked to Lori Wright. She said all these things about profitability. The Xbox was pointing out that they don't make money on Xbox. It's all subsidized, et cetera, et cetera. But they did not provide the documentation that was requested and ordered by the court to back up these claims. And then Apple says, despite not providing Apple with the relevant documents, Ms. Wright testified at trial about subjects contained within them. For example, Ms. Wright testified about the supposed unprofitability of Microsoft's console business without providing the profit and loss statement from her files that could have substantiated or disproven her testimony. She also testified about Xbox Cloud Gaming, the Xbox console business, and meetings between Ms. Wright's team and Apple. These are all subjects of the documents in her personal files that were requested by Apple but not produced to Apple before her testimony. Ms. Wright testified that no one had told her of the consequences of failing to produce documents relevant to these topics. Apple notes that Console for Epic and Microsoft coordinated, at least with respect to scheduling Ms. Wright's trial testimony. The court surely expected that Epic would communicate the substance of the court's order to Microsoft. But even after being apprised of this court's order on the stand, Ms. Wright refused to say she would do anything differently. Rather, she would have to think about complying with this court's clear directive to produce documents. Now, this is a motion to find a witness non-credible made to a judge in a bench trial that is going to be determining the credibility of these witnesses herself. So to some extent, this is a legal necessity once you have that kind of testimony that says, we didn't produce the documents that you requested. You know that this could affect your credibility. The judge even said, yes, it could affect your credibility, et cetera, et cetera. You file this motion and it doesn't really matter exactly where it goes from here. The judge understands that Apple has a complaint about this foundationary basis and the judge will take that into account or decide that it's not that important really on her own recognizance. But it does help to express that Apple is unhappy with at least a portion of the discovery documents produced by a major player, as it turns out, in this entire conversation, which is Microsoft, who is helping by proxy Epic in their fight against Apple by doing things like lowering the rate of their Windows store cut and providing evidence at trial like this, helping them out with the restraining order and preliminary injunction levels. If you go back and look at the series, Microsoft helped Epic with some of the arguments in that specific case. And so Apple wants to declare Microsoft as effectively non-credible, at least for purposes of this witness. And it will be interesting to see where it goes. With that, as basically our only background material that happened in between day four and day five, we now can talk about day five of Epic versus Apple. Once again, we are turning to Addie Robertson at The Verge, who in my opinion is doing by far the best job of live tweeting everything coming out of the testimony of this case. We couldn't do it without all the journalists that are putting all their time and resources into talking about this. We just don't have the time here. 
in virtual legality to go over the trial and have that on the phone all day. So I very much appreciate everyone's coverage. And like I have said, as part of every one of these videos, don't just take my word for any of this. Don't just rely on virtual legality as your sole source. I am going through a couple of steps removed from the actual testimony at the trial. So every different journalist, every different person that's going to be actually commenting on these things is going to have a little different view of what's happening. So I highly suggest checking out a bunch of different sources. With that said, Ms. Robertson says, today we've got more testimony from Tristan Kuzminska, Apple marketing VP. So that's an Apple witness. We were talking with him a little bit at part of the end of last video followed by Epic's Stephen Allison and Matthew Weisinger. Now, we're actually not going to get to the Weisinger testimony because the court really doesn't get to the Weisinger testimony. He starts at about 45 minutes left in the day, gets through his introduction, what he is. He will be popping back on our video screens when we are talking about day six of the trial. But believe me when I say Kuzminska and Allison had enough to say to maybe fill two videos. So we're going to try to do it as quickly and efficiently as possible. So where do we start? Well, we're back talking about Roblox. If you didn't watch the video about day four of the testimony, there is a weird blind alley that both Apple and Epic have gone down about what Roblox is. And as I said in that previous video, people complain about my pronunciation of Roblox. I don't play it, but that's how it looks to me. So I'm going to use that pronunciation. But in any event, whether or not Roblox is a game has become this issue of paramount importance between the two parties. Now, we're going to look at the guidelines again, and I'm going to point out that game really isn't what matters in this conversation when we're talking about the Epic Game Store, because what appears to be happening here in the testimony, and this sometimes happens in trials, if you've ever watched anything, even when old court TV was on, you can see blind alleys and weird kind of digressions happen when people just kind of get caught in their own argumentation. And a good judge, and this is appears to be a good judge, I'm not saying that she's not, will try to steer things back. And I think she has been doing that uh, to some extent. But what we've got right now is Epic Game Store trying to prove that Apple treats like things differently, right? That it treats like apps differently. If, for instance, Apple thinks it will be more competitive with Apple's offerings, it might reject it or make it difficult for that app to join the App Store in a way that it wouldn't do if something weren't competitive with Apple. That's Epic's thesis. And you've heard a lot of developers kind of complain about that mindset at Apple. It's a good line of argument from Epic. But what it's resulted in now is this notion that Roblox is a store within a store similar to what might be presented in the Epic Game Store. And as we said in the last video, it's pretty easy to distinguish the Robloxes of the world from an app that wants to sell other video games like an Epic Game Store. And I think that the parties have missed that by getting into this really long digression about what is a game. I think Roblox is probably best thought of as a game. If the two categories are game and application, where application is intended to hit things like financing and Excel spreadsheet uh, documents and apps or weather apps and things that don't have a game component to it, Roblox is closer to the game end of the spectrum than it is to the application end of the spectrum. But these two parties have gotten into this fight about what a game is. So as Addie Robertson says here, we're back to talking about Roblox which I may remind you Apple's review group determined is not a game with games inside it, but a game with social experiences inside it. In Minecraft, says the testimony here, you enter a map that is a particular world or a canvas, but it's not capable of doing dynamic things beyond what the creator of the experience has already programmed into that. And I think this is, again, the important distinction. When we talk about Epic Game Store, when we talk about Steam, when we talk about the App Store, we're talking about a storefront that provides the capability of getting completely independent, freestanding software applications that you can download, stream, or otherwise use that don't require any kind of connectivity or connection point to the App Store experience, right? But when we're talking about Roblox, what we're talking about is essentially additional things. You want to call them games, that's great. Apple wants to call them experiences for reasons that I think are stupid. Uh, but whatever they are, they are connected inherently to Roblox as a network, as an operating system, as a thing. And so 
it's pretty easy in my mind to distinguish something that sells freestanding applications from something that sells essentially extensions to itself that all have to operate within that ecosystem. If I'm Apple, that's what I'm hitting on, that this is like a Minecraft. This is like something that all acts inside a universe. It is not the same thing as a game store. And some commenters to Ms. Robertson and some other the people that we'll talk about as part of this video say, well, couldn't Epic do that with Fortnite? Couldn't they make essentially a bunch of experiences and sell them within Fortnite and do that kind of thing? And I don't think Apple has any problem with that whatsoever. That's one of the reasons why the metaverse argument from Tim Sweeney and from Epic is a little bit strange. They want the metaverse. It's unclear exactly how Apple is blocking the metaverse. It's blocking the Epic Game Store. It's taking a 30% cut of in-app payment, but it's not blocking the concept that you can build whatever you want into Fortnite. It didn't block it in Roblox. We haven't heard any indication that it's blocking it in Fortnite. Epic is fighting a different fight and trying to use Roblox as a proxy that I don't think is a good fit, but Apple is not helping its case. Everybody looks at what Apple is saying in this testimony and says, Roblox isn't a game? Are, are you sure? I mean, what is it? And yeah, not a lot of the Roblox materials might have end goals, end states, things like that, but it's still something like play. If the difference is actually play and work, it's clearly on the play side. And so what are we fighting about? You sound crazy when you say these things, Apple, and it doesn't help your case because when you sound crazy, we go and look at the rest of what you're claiming in your litigation. Okay, but is Roblox itself a game? Apple lawyer asks. We look at Roblox as an app because it's listed as an app in the app store. And what is Fortnite listed as? A game. Oh, hell yeah, Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers is now saying Kuzminska needs to explain why Roblox doesn't offer what Apple would consider games because it doesn't make sense, says Nick Stat over at Protocol. And of course, where the rubber really hits the road here is that they say Roblox has classified itself as an app. Other games classify themselves as a game. Uh-oh. As it turns out, Roblox classifies itself as a game. Well, that's not great if you're Apple, because you're sitting there on the stand and this isn't something that's going to bite you in the overall litigation, but that you're having this fight, you've said something that's clearly wrong, everybody thinks you're acting kind of silly when the judge asks you this question, it's not great, and why did you do it? For no reason that I can see. Your actual guidelines talk about stores within a stores as follows. Creating an interface for displaying third-party apps, extensions, or plugins similar to the App Store or as a general interest collection. <laughs> things that look like the App Store are illegal, not things that look like Roblox. And that's all based on applications, not games. What is acceptable? Displaying your own apps for purchase or promotion within your app, provided the app is not merely a catalog of apps. If you're not just a storefront, you can advertise your own stuff, including extensions. It just can't look like an App Store or be a general interest collection of stuff. The word game appears in these guidelines 38 times. And among those 38 times, a lot of them are spent on trying to kill the X clouds of the world, which is one of the reasons I have said as part of this series that Microsoft and Nvidia have a better case than Epic. You can go and look at that as specifically targeted and potentially anti-competitive to aim at these streaming games in a way that they don't aim at movies and other content that requires ratings and reviews, which they otherwise cover in different portions of the guidelines. But in terms of the store within a store concept, they only talk about apps. They only talk about not doing things that sell apps in general. And it's not really linked to this game concept. So it's a little bit odd. And if you really take it to its logical conclusion, if Apple is allowing Roblox in this way, and you think Roblox is a, is a store within a store, and you think that Apple is potentially anti-competitive because it's specifically mean to games, which make it the most money, isn't Roblox, if you're Epic, good evidence that Apple isn't doing that? Isn't it actually evidence that Apple isn't being particularly mean towards games, that it's actually looking at Roblox and saying, no, 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 clearly you're not being an app store and we can understand that and we want you to make money and you're a good business partner and let's do it. Even though from Epic's standpoint, they want to say that games are competitive. There was an entire bit of testimony that say, hey, App Arcade is competing with things that sell games. Isn't App Arcade conceptually competitive with the Epic Game Store? And Apple says, maybe, I mean, we don't know exactly. But 
if that's your main thrust of argument, Roblox, if it is a game store, and I don't think it's a game store, but from a theoretical perspective, it's offering game experiences and Apple's allowing it, doesn't that just suggest that Apple's okay with games as a class? And then we get into the question of can Apple treat Epic separately just because? And the answer is yes. The law doesn't require businesses to work with each other, doesn't require businesses to support even competitors. And so Apple might just decide it doesn't like Epic. Roblox has never put a surreptitious hot fix in. Roblox has never asked for special dispensation. Roblox has never sent an email that asked for things and said it was our moral imperative to do X, Y, or Z as Mr. Sweeney has been shown to do across the video game industry. Maybe they just like Roblox more. That isn't of itself illegal. And so it's a really odd line of questions, but I don't blame Epic for pushing on it because Apple has been stupid because the game's generalization doesn't matter. Now, one thing I will say about that little sequence of tweets that I went over is I kind of pulled them from different portions of the testimony. Unlike some of the other videos we've done where we've gone in order across what somebody has said, I did that because it was a really meandering piece of testimony, at least as described by the various folks that were live tweeting it, and we have no reason to disbelieve them, that kind of bounced from one topic to the next, back to the first uh, a couple of times. And so that was the Roblox sequence. The next sequence is really about, once again, the efficacy of Apple's security protocols and their app review system. Or as Addy Robertson says, anyhow, we're talking about categories of objectionable content that Apple rejects from the app store. Things like challenge apps that tell people to do dangerous stairs. There are hundreds of developers that run scams claiming they're official Fortnite apps. Uh, we've got other things that are all related to scam apps. Uh, critical errors, references to Kuzminska's internal documentation that says, well, maybe we aren't doing this too terribly well. There are hundreds of developers that run scams, as we just said. As Nick Stat says, Kaminska asked whether app review is unnecessary because of those mistakes. It makes me believe that we have to continuously be better. These mistakes came from customer and developer reports. That tells me our store is a trusted place to get apps, and this is an issue that we are trying to present as some place that is secure. They have a place to send this note. We get that note and we try to do better. And again, as I've said before, I think this is a good line of attack from Epic saying essentially that you haven't earned your 30% because what you are doing isn't very useful, but it also is defendable by Apple because there doesn't have to be perfection in what they are attempting to achieve in order for it to be a reasonable business decision. Which again, since we are unlikely to wind up in the judge ruling on this as a per se violation of antitrust law, just by law, just by its very existence, we wind up discussing what is reasonable for the party that is engaged in these activities. And that's after we establish that they are a monopolist in and of themselves, which is of course a difficult hurdle to climb just in this case alone. But once we get to that point, once we are talking about a monopolist restraining trade, doing these bad things, Apple can still defend itself by saying, we have a business reason to try to offer a secure environment. We don't have to be perfect at it. We're human beings, but we are trying, we are putting those resources to work. And that is something that we should be allowed to do. We should be allowed to review apps that come onto our store to determine whether or not they are secure. And if we fail at it, that's on us. That doesn't look good. And people can take their business elsewhere. And we're going to try to continually earn that business. Okay, we are continuing to go over apps that are not good, including one that is not safe for work, a concept defined in court as something you would not want your employer to see. Unless you're on a moderation team, I guess, in which case it is literally your job. Now, there's a very critical line of questioning from the judge about whether Apple's lack of competition on iOS for app stores stifles innovation in app review, because Minska says Apple looks at Android and other app stores to see how they approach scams, frauds, and takedowns. And this is one of those interesting areas that the de definition of the relevant market is entirely dependent upon. Does Apple actually have to go and look at what other folks are doing with respect to keeping their app store safe? If they are, if they feel they have to, then there is likely a competitive market of some kind. And the argument has always been, at least before Epic brought its case here, that Apple's competitive market is on phones in general, on people selling 
different devices. Why would you buy an iPhone? Why would you buy an iPad? Well, it's super secure and it's got an Apple on the back, which I'm sure some of the commenters will say is why folks buy Apple products. They really like that brand recognition, but that there's a reason to buy it and that we're competing with other hardware manufacturers in the space in which we are selling our hardware and our operating system at a software level is a part of that. So yes, it's a critical line of questioning from the judge. It is ultimately dependent on whether she finds a market in only the operating system access. Because if Apple is a monopolist of its operating system, then there really shouldn't be outward pressure to do much of anything. They have 100% access rights over their own hardware, and you wouldn't have this external competition. If there is, and this is what Kuzminska is testifying to here, then it is suggestive of a belief in Apple having a competing market of some sort, which has been historically the way we have looked at hardware purveyors and the software that helps run them. Now, historically isn't very long in the age of the law, so that's why we have a novel case like this one that could absolutely set precedent for the future and that we can't predict with a high level of granularity. Epic's lawyer is back redirecting to Mac OS, pointing out that people can directly download apps from outside Apple stores there, but it's still considered safe for kids, etc. I think there's safety on Mac that's superior when downloading from the App Store. The threats that we see on iOS, even within the App Store, I can't say that a user outside the Mac App Store has a safe and trusted experience. Says they're taking additional risks. Says operating systems across the board with Apple work really hard to keep people safe, but that the curated element still provides really critical safety elements. Again, this is Apple's marketing, right? And you don't have to believe it. They try to put reports up that say it's a more safe and secure environment. I think a lot of people do. And it might turn out that that Sweeney testimony about using an iPhone because of, among other things, as he says, privacy and security concerns could come back and be a big factor in the ultimate decision. It's hard to say, but that Apple believes that the curation approach is useful. Clearly, a certain amount of customers believe that the curation approach is useful. And then from a legal perspective, the question is, should the law say that it's not? Should the law say you have to include X, Y, or Z, other store, other apps? And that's what Epic's asking for. So it's interesting. And I think we just have the same kind of discussion uh, for the rest of those tweets. Now, that testimony is done. Kuzminska leaves the stand and Steve Allison of Epic is called to the stand. He's the vice president and general manager of the Epic Game Store. And he gives a lot of testimony about the background of video games, about it work at GameStop, all these various other things. And you get some really interesting quotes that I've included here primarily for their amusement factor, including the judge notes that you could go to GameStop during that period, but asks more about the reason for PC game retail collapsing. Was that also because the PC couldn't handle the amount of power required for these games? <laughs> Safe to say Judge Rogers does not know any vocal PC gamers. I just like that. And some of you might come in and say, oh, does this judge know anything? Blah, 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 blah. I will say this. You do not know what you don't ask questions about. If you're a lawyer, or maybe if you're just walking through life and you're curious about something, I understand that somehow you think the question might make you sound like an idiot. And some people may think this question makes the judge sound like an idiot, but she didn't know. And so she asked the question. And you know what? That's useful. She now knows a little bit more about the power of PC and that the PC is the stronger platform, but that Steam came in and digital distribution came in and PC retail died. And that is a function of digital stores operating in the environment. In exchange for joining Epic Game Store, Epic would promise devs a recoupable guarantee where they'd promise a minimum payout based on estimated sales. We got some numbers related to this from the trial documents. And these were very interesting. This is from some of the documents that were out there earlier. I'm not going to go over every one except to point out that this is how a company would think about spending money on those exclusives that it was buying for its store and giving away as free games, right? Epic Game Store, free games, Subnautica, Super Meat Boy, What Remains of Edith Finch, Jackbox, Axiom Verge, etc., etc. And you can see exactly what they were tracking here. The date that it went out, the number of people that downloaded it, that's your entitlements, the amount of money they spent on getting those free games, and the new Epic accounts that arose from them, and then dividing the dollar amount spent on the buyout from the new Epic accounts to arrive at a user acquisition cost, as well as tracking what was new to Epic. And so you see, there are winners and losers. When you talk about a big company making decisions, they use the best of the information available to them. They use analytics and data to try to establish 
a baseline for what they should pay, and then the market answers the question. It is not a precise science. So you can pay $750,000 to bring Celeste in as a free game, only get 62,000 users out of that, which means that each user costs $12. Or you can say, for instance, pay $50,000 for a game called Canary and get a very similar number, 63,000 users, and those users cost you 94 cents. You're doing your best. You're trying to figure out what is the amount of money you want to spend and the leverage that these other parties have on you and what they're willing to sell a game for free into your ecosystem is. And ultimately, this is what businesses do every day. And it's a very interesting document. All of the documents that have come out of this litigation have been very interesting. But overall, Epic's done a pretty good job here. Epic has acquired users at a cost of $2.37 per user with maybe a little fudging here by saying Metro costs $0 when we know that it was involved in a Metro package. But $2.37 per user is a very reasonable user acquisition cost for people working in the video game industry. There are winners, there are losers, but it is still very interesting. And that was Epic's model. Does the Epic Game Store do anything to protect account security? Yes, Allison describes. What about external threats? It's experienced about the same quantity of bad actors as other platforms. Any issues with fraud on the Epic Game Store? Describes an issue in which Ubisoft and Epic did a cross-entitlement deal with Uplay where you could buy on one store and receive the game on both. Bad actors started buying the game on the Epic Game Store, getting refunds, and then continuing to play on Uplay. We actually saw an email about this. Tom Warren posts it. I think this largely affected the Division 2. Epic had to apologize for the crazy high fraud rates a couple of years ago. This is in May of 2019. Tim Sweeney, over to these folks. Dear Eves, I'm writing to apologize for the shortcomings in our Epic Game Store implementation and our Uplay integration. In the past 48 hours, the rate of fraudulent transactions on Division 2 surpassed 70% and was approaching 90%. Sophisticated hackers were creating Epic accounts, buying Ubisoft games with stolen credit cards, then selling the linked Uplay accounts faster than we were disabling linked Uplay purchases for fraud. Fraud rates for other Epic Game Store titles are under 2% and Fortnite is under 1%. So 70% fraud was an extraordinary situation. I'm not sure why you highlight that Fortnite is so low. That's your own game. But in any event, to stop the fraud, we disabled purchasing of Ubisoft games. We will make our best efforts to restore service as quickly as we can. This depends on a real-time system for disabling refunded and fraudulent purposes purchases on Uplay and anti-fraud improvements in Epic service. This work will likely take at least two weeks to complete. The fault is this situation is entirely Epic's and all of the minimum revenue guarantees remain in place to ensure our performance. And that's interesting in and of itself. I don't think this is a bad email other than maybe just talking about Fortnite randomly uh, in the middle of it, but it's it's their baby. Uh, I don't think this is a bad email. This sounds like what Epic should be doing when something like this happens. But of course, it makes everybody cautious when you talk about something like the Epic Game Store, when you talk about any storefront. This happened on Steam or on the iOS, the App Store, of course, that when something like this happens, you worry about the safety of your data, the safety of everything else involved with interacting with a platform like this. And the Epic Game Store had a major problem. Now, this was a unique circumstance. The the cross kind of key giving across multiple platforms and what could be accomplished through that particular uniqueness Uh, I don't think applies to most of the games on the Epic Game Store, but it is worth noting because, again, Epic's theory is Apple isn't earning its money. Apple doesn't earn 30%. Apple should be at 3% or 5%, and Epic is. When one of Apple's counter volleys is, well, the Epic Game Store doesn't have the feature set of the uh, iOS or the App Store or Steam or any of its major competitors. It's trying to run solely as the dollar store discount place for video games. And so the court should take that into account and it should note things like major fraudulent issues. Epic expects third-party game store to first turn a profit in 2024, including first-party games would move that to 2022 or 2023. Does Allison Allison ask if they expect to recoup their investment in third-party games? Yes, we do. Now, there's a couple of things happening there, right? First of all, projections are projections. You see this on any type of investor document. You are going to project what you think is going to happen, and the world is never going to be exactly like that. Might be better, might be worse. 
including first party games would move it to 2022 or 2023 is complete non sequitur. The first party games are making money in and of themselves. When asking about the actual profitability of a different initiative, like a storefront, you wouldn't include what you would be making as money anyway. So that doesn't matter. And then do we expect to recoup our investment? The answer to that, unless you are just acting completely outside your fiduciary obligations to your company is always yes. You aren't doing this kind of thing because you don't think it will eventually be valuable to the company. But are you right? Maybe, maybe not. Certainly just in the testimony of this particular litigation, Google Stadia project has come up in a couple of places as effectively, is that dead? We think it might be dead. Did Google kill that yet? And no, Google hasn't killed it yet. They just stopped their in-house development cycle. But this litigation has pointed out, we don't know. And Google has a history of trying things. And if they don't immediately work, throwing them in the graveyard. So what is the purpose of Epic Game Store? Apple is justified in saying, are you going to keep up with this? Are you actually going to make money from this? Is this just designed to highlight that, oh, you're doing your own thing that Apple and App Store isn't doing to show, well, the market could sustain this? Because if you are, you haven't proven that the market will sustain it. Allison says, Epic Game Store does not require developers to use its payment system. A couple of examples is Wizards of the Coast, who make Magic the Gathering Arena. Ubisoft also uses its own payment system. And Tim Sweeney actually went out in a series of tweets and talked about this during the course of this controversy and said this. And it's very interesting because if you look at what the Epic Games Store provides, they provide this access point for games. And if you don't use your payment system for a free-to-play game or free-to-download game like Wizards of the Coast's Magic the Gathering Arena... It's unclear exactly what Epic is making on that particular application. And I think Tim Sweeney winds up saying they're not making anything, but it's useful to have another point where people are coming to get to that application. And so it effectively acts as advertising, but it's probably not a long-term sustainable model in and of itself. So Apple continues to bring this up and Epic continues to say, well, Apple doesn't have to require its payment system, etc. Allison asked about bringing Epic Game Store to iOS. He says they wanted to, but Apple policies forbid it. We, in fact, had emails on that topic. What commission rate would EGS charge on iOS? Well, we would charge that 88.12, Allison says, which is what Epic is using to really rally the developers. And I don't blame them. You can go get an 18% reduction in the cut that you owe to a distributor. Absolutely. Go try to get it. Not sure about the litigation, but certainly try to put that market pressure on Apple and on the rest. Apple is now questioning Allison, so we've moved to cross-examination. Notes that when a consumer goes to the internet and searches Epic Games Store, what comes up is epicgames.com. Okay, I can see where they're going with this. The Epic Games Store FAQ has a warning. Do not trust other sources as they are likely unsafe. Apple's lawyer says if you're going to download software, trust is important. And yes, they're leading, obviously. That's what cross-examination does. But again, one of Apple's major counterpunches, as we've seen through the first four days of the trial, is don't you protect your own platform, Microsoft? Don't you protect your own platform, Epic? You have rules, don't you? You don't let anything on. And you now have a warning in your fact that says don't trust things from other sources. While also suing Google and Android right now for putting too much quote unquote friction between sideloading apps by having a warning come up that says, we don't know what this is, be careful. So what are you coming for, Epic? What are you arguing for? Because you are doing these very same things yourself. Apple's lawyer asks if Allison knows that Epic's 88-12 commission split is way outside the industry standard. I would not, says Allison. Lawyer turns to a previous deposition Allison gave, where he answers the same question with yes. Fine, Allison says. It's a pretty good moment if you're a lawyer, if you got somebody exactly opposite on one of their previous depositions, then that always feels good uh, when you're talking about uh, hitting witnesses on cross-examination. But in this particular case, he tries to walk it back a little bit. Allison has thrown a bone during redirect, asked to clarify his comments on the 88-12 revenue split being outside the norm, which he appeared to have contradicted. He mentions that things have changed like Microsoft lowering its fees days before the trial and changes to the App Store and Google Play commissions, which all function on a revenue basis. So 30% is still the standard. And I don't think anybody is confused about that. It's the standard across all the video game consoles. It's the standard at Steam, even though they have their own revenue adjustments as well. 12% is nobody's standard, except for now Microsoft, 
who hasn't at all proven the viability of that number because they just announced it, I think three days before this trial started, seemingly in an effort to give Epic the ability to answer something in this fashion, talking about Microsoft lowering its fees. Again, Microsoft seems invested in trying to see if it can help Epic win. Why? Because they're a software company. And if they could break down some walled gardens, even if it costs them their Xbox walled garden, they are probably willing to do it because they could sell software into additional markets and might even be in a better position to leverage their size and resources uh, than Epic itself is, which might create an interesting situation where Epic to win this fight. Now we get into why the thumbnail is what the thumbnail is. Ooh, now the Apple lawyer is going after the fact that Itch.io has porn games on it, despite Epic rejecting sexual games on the Epic Games Store. Now, what is happening here? So what is Itch.io? Itch.io is a separate platform for largely independent, very, very small games, has hundreds of thousands of these things. If you haven't checked it out, it's got some really weird stuff and some really interesting stuff. But what did they announce? They announced that as of this morning, the Itch desktop client is available to download on the Epic Games Store, which is odd. And they say that in the next sentence. If you prefer to launch your game launchers through other game launchers, then this is perfect for you, right? Why would you want to go to Itch.io through Epic Game Store? Unclear. This is the same client that we have hosted on our site, so you don't need to re-download or change anything. Why did we do this? They reached out to us a few months back about how they were exploring adding apps to their store. We thought it was a funny idea, but also a good opportunity to potentially expose a lot more people to Itch.io as the Epic Game Store has a pretty large audience. And then technically it's going to be the same. Do I need to do anything? Nope. This is just a new place for people to discover and download our app. Nothing about how developers or players access Itch.io is changing. Now there's a couple of things happening here and we're going to look at the testimony because The Verge found this interesting enough that they actually transcribed the testimony in this particular case. But one of the things that's interesting here is know what Itch.io says about why they would join a store. It was a good opportunity to potentially expose a lot more people to Itch.io. It's advertising. It's access to a larger audience than you might otherwise find just advertising your game yourself, which of course is Apple's primary argument for why it deserves a significant cut of the profits of your video game. That 30% cut is based, as Apple would tell the story, around the fact that it has all of these big marketing initiatives, that it has all of this brand goodwill, that it sells people on their ecosystem, on their platform, and that you, developer, who might come out of the woodwork, are benefiting from years and years and years of all of that effort to get to our billion users. And so we deserve a portion of that money because we have established the marketplace into which you are selling. Here, Epic Games may or may not have paid Itch.io. We don't have any background for what this actual arrangement would be. But why did they join them? Because they thought it would be valuable as marketing. Now, is it valuable as marketing? I don't know. Maybe people found out a bit about Itch.io that didn't know about it before. Maybe they're finding out about it in virtual legality that didn't know about it before. Check it out. But it became a topic of conversation because of what it includes within it. Apple attorney. On April 22nd of this year, Epic Games Store added the Itch.io app to its store. Steve Allison, Epic Games. Yes, you're aware of that. I am. And you're aware that Itch.io is a third-party app store. I am. And the court has also heard that Itch.io was added without reviewing all the games. You're aware of that? Yes. And are you aware, sir, that Itch.io includes so-called adult games, such as a game called Sisterly Lust? We're not going to go into the details on this. They didn't go into the details on it in federal court. But you can see where this is going, and it's a very interesting avenue attack from my perspective. Apple looks at this and says, look, our problem when we're talking about these things is that you didn't review all the games, and we want to make sure what is running on our system. Now, maybe this swings back on Roblox. I don't know if there's anything bad in Roblox land. I would assume not, because they have to try to aim their product at kids. But that in this particular case, Epic put on a store that's an access point for other games that, as we will see, wouldn't meet Epic's own standards. You may not be aware then, but the description of that game includes a list of fetishes, which include many words that are not appropriate for us to speak in federal courts. Are you aware of that? You know, there's a number of words I'm saying in this video that I didn't think I would say in virtual legality. Here we are. I am not. And the list goes on. There are many games on Itch.io. I won't even read the names out loud, but they are both offensive and sexualized. You are not aware of that? 
Itch.io is an app store that is not the Epic Game Store. Itch is distributing Itch.io games. Epic is only distributing the app store Itch.io. And Itch.io is now available as an app on the Epic Game Store, correct? Yes. And those apps on Itch.io have not gone through any review process whatsoever, correct? They are subject to whatever process Itch.io puts in front of their devices. Right. So Epic Games, you're sure, is on the hook for whatever process Itch.io puts in place to review these games that are so offensive we cannot speak about them here, correct? I disagree with that statement. And undoubtedly, the disagreement here is on the hook for, right? What is Epic responsible for? What is Epic in charge of when it links to something that effectively goes outside of its bounds. This might be one of the reasons that you also see those warnings when you're on a Steam forum or somewhere else that says, you're about to leave our page. We're no longer responsible for what you're doing. And maybe Epic should put something like that when you use the Itch.io app. I don't know. But Apple is trying to point out that Epic is helping to facilitate the availability of games that are inappropriate and wouldn't meet Epic's own standards, let alone Apple's. And so should Epic be concerned about that? And more importantly, from Apple's perspective, should Apple be concerned about that since this entire litigation is about Epic getting their own store on the iOS ecosystem and they've already now demonstrated that they aren't so concerned about where that store leads? So can you or can you not access those apps through your app store? You cannot access those apps through the Epic Game Store, no. You can access those apps through their application, which that is what we are downloading, Itch.io, which is an app store. Users have their own account with them and you can use their store and are subject to their end user agreement. So if I have a phone and your app store was on that phone, that other store could be downloaded, which has all of this offensive material. And that's Judge Rogers. So, you know, she's interjecting here. Not on your phone. The app could be downloaded onto your PC and you could access their app on your PC. But that's what you want to do on a phone too. That's what I understand. I.e., that's what you're suing about, correct? (laughs) I don't know that we would do that with Itch.io on a phone, but you're doing it now so I could access it on my PC, right? Yes. And this lawsuit's about your ability to do it on your phone, right? Yes. And just so we're clear, back to the attorneys, you can go to Epic Game Store, click Itch.io and download the offensive games. Are you aware of that? Allison again, you can go to the Epic Game Store launcher and you can launch Itch.io, which takes you out of the Epic Game Store and launches their application. You are then subject to their user agreement and you are in the Itch.io ecosystem. And the attorney comes back. You said to the court just a second ago that you wouldn't want to do that with Itch.io. You wouldn't want to put Itch.io on the phone. I I don't know that we would or we wouldn't. I don't even know that it's available as a mobile application. Because the reason that you said that to the court is because you're recognizing that this is offensive and sexualized conduct that can be accessed. I disagree with that statement. Now that you know there are offensive and sexualized apps on Itch.io, as the head of the Epic Game Store, do you plan to do anything about that? I don't have an answer for you. I will dig in when we get back. But I don't have an answer for you. I'm not sure. These apps were on Itch.io and not the Epic Game Store. Well, Epic has been advertising putting these apps in the store. Mr. Sweeney put up a tweet about Itch.io. Again, Mr. Sweeney's tweets, constant story. And now you seem to be distancing yourself from Itch.io because you realize there are apps in there that you have not reviewed and cannot stand by. Well, I disagree with what you're saying. Itch.io is an incredible community for developers that we support fully. They have an open platform and therefore have different moderation standards than the Epic Game Store. I was just wondering, sir, if you support fully the offensive and sexualized content that is available there when people go to the Epic Game Store and download Itch.io. Allison, I don't support sexualized content of any sort. I suppose Allison's relationships hardest hit. In any event, you've got this line of questioning that is very, very interesting. That, okay, Epic Games has put on this other store through their store. So now, if this were to go on sight unseen, Onto the Apple store, you've got not only a store within a store, but a store within a store within a store. We're getting into Christopher Nolan levels of layers upon layers here. And Apple is rightly pointing out, look, we don't want anything to do with that content. Epic has already demonstrated that they aren't reviewing that content and didn't care to put it as a contact point with their store. And so we at Apple are trying to establish that we don't want third parties making this decision for us. Now, is that a winner? I don't know. It's a little bit attenuated, right? Epic has a very good argument. We're not putting those games on the Epic Game Store. We're putting an Itch.io access point on the Epic Game Store. It would be the same as putting a web browser on the PlayStation. The PlayStation doesn't support everything that you might be able to access on your web browser, does it? And so Epic might have a good argument here. Apple has a pretty good argument as well. 
And it's one of those things which I do think will be looked at in a certain way if you already think that Epic is somewhat deceptive or perhaps lax in their security and other policies, which is one of the things that Apple's trying to establish, right? Project Liberty, very deceptive. Their security standards are like, look at all the fraud with Ubisoft. Look, they just accepted Itch.io. They didn't review all these games. We want to review the games. And this is kind of a sidebar note to the Microsofts and NVIDIAs of the world. We want to review these games because we don't know what you're putting on there. We don't know what people are accessing through our phone and we're concerned about it, ostensibly. You don't have to believe them. And so they bring up this claim and I do think it's an interesting one. Latest from the Itch.io press room, never missing a beat on marketing. We are renaming our sensitive content filter to unspeakable games. I got to respect it. You got to respect the marketing poll and paying attention to a federal litigation at that level. Of course, if your company is mentioned in it, you probably are paying more attention than you otherwise would be. And we're finishing off here with the final couple of comments. Apple's lawyers say that it's apples to oranges to compare an app store's fees with that of a credit card company. I feel like there's a better way to say apples to oranges when you're actually representing the company Apple, but it is what it is. That's important because Epic CEO Tim Sweeney has cited the low Visa MasterCard fees as what would be fair for the App Store and Google Play. And you've heard me say it now maybe a dozen times that that was always a ridiculous assertion that the judge almost immediately said, what are you talking about at the preliminary temporary restraining order level, even before getting into the injunction motions said, "Uh, I'm pretty sure they're not just a credit card payment processor and you appear to be asking them to get 0% and that doesn't feel right either that actually saying it should be 3 or 5% might hold more water if Epic were only charging 3 or 5%. But instead, Epic comes out and says, no, we do some stuff for that 12%. Okay, maybe you should be arguing for the 12% then. Certainly it is apples to oranges. Apple clearly, clearly performs more functions than a simple Stripe or Visa slash MasterCard situation. And so Epic was all, always pushing too hard on that particular note. And maybe... Maybe it'll work out for them. Maybe they push too hard to get any kind of uh, redress on that. Finally, one of the topics of conversation, this popped up in a number of places in the Allison testimony, was whether or not Epic was creating a bad situation for video gamers in general. That there was backlash to things like the Ooblets blog that talked about Ooblets becoming an exclusive on the Epic Game Store. And I talked about that in virtual legality. You can check it out. I talked about messaging. One of the things that was a real problem with the Ooblets message was that it was kind of um, sarcastic. It was snide. Uh, And that's never a good thing when you've got an audience that was otherwise backing you. And now you're telling them that they have to go through a specific avenue and that they didn't have to go through yesterday. And you're being snide about it. I never thought that was a good idea. I think it was a bad idea. But I got to be honest with you. We've talked through a lot of legal issues here about Epic versus Apple. I'm not entirely certain what direction Apple is coming from on this. Yes, uh, Epic's taken some heat for making exclusives. Yes, you can kind of frame that as a similar situation to wanting to keep a walled garden, uh, but it's not. It's not an identical situation. And what the impact of the people is to that is of limited legal import. So I think at best, this is primarily, again, trying to shade Epic as a bad actor. Shade Epic is a little bit naughty in the industry, a little bit of a wild card. A lot of these documents coming out, the emails, the lines of questioning about Tim Sweeney, about Epic, are trying to paint this company as a rogue nation, as somebody that's willing to do anything, break up all this stuff, and doesn't care who it hurts. That you've got gaming community coming out and making all these complaints because this isn't the way that PC gaming has operated. That making it exclusive to your store is as anti-competitive as anything that you're arguing about Uh, here in court. And that's not true. Uh, Again, I'm not siding with Apple here. Uh, Epic is allowed to go sign exclusives, is allowed to spend marketing dollars on bringing their games into their store. You don't have to love it, just like you don't have to love Sony charging for crossplay or any of Apple's ridiculously long set of guidelines, many of which don't help the user and the consumer at all. You don't have to like any of those things to think that they are legal. And I think there have been a number of good attacks that Apple has made that have shaded Epic in a negative direction. And I think those are effective in certain parts. I don't think this is one of them. Finishing off, we go to Matthew Wessinger, Vice President of Marketing and Epic Games. As I said at the top of this video, he didn't get a chance to really say anything. Uh, so we'll be coming back to him. Uh, we'll be, of course, following up 
on Epic versus Apple next week. I can't promise a video every day, so we might be combining a few days of the testimony. Uh, but I hope you have enjoyed this first week of coverage of Epic versus Apple. Please do leave a comment letting me know uh, whether or not you're liking this format, whether or not you have any improvements you'd like to see, any changes you'd like to see done uh, in these discussions. I very much enjoyed talking them over with you. If you like this channel, if you like all of these conversations, I could not do it without the support of folks like you, subscribers, patrons. We have a Patreon. We've got tips at Streamlabs, a store with fun stuff. Reasonable minds can differ whether you're on Epic or Apple side. I think there is non-zero chance of success. I don't think either side is crazy, even though I think Apple's got the stronger case. Otherwise, if you just subscribe, ring that bell, upvotes, downvotes, leave comments, tell folks that we're here, tell your friends we're having these conversations. Every single little bit helps get the notions of virtual legality and hopefully a little bit more information, education, and entertainment out there on this very, very important case and subject matter. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.